Hey, how you doing? Justin here. In today's lesson, I'm going to be explaining what I call reactive listening. And of all of the things that I've taught, I've been in this game for like a long time now, I've taught a lot of stuff. I think this is the most valuable thing that I can offer people, you guys. I've taught it in workshops all around the world, and I've seen really crazy effective results with you know, it takes a bit of practice, like all of the stuff I'm showing you, but this one, this one really works. For all of you that are feeling like, I've been doing these solos and it never really felt very musical and I never feel like I land on the right note and how do you make a melodic solo and all of those kind of questions, well, I think this is the answer. I'd, it, try it and see. It, I, I really feel like this is a, a very, very powerful idea. Now, in short, it's about learning how to recognize chord tones with your ear. So if we're playing in the key of G, and we know that we've got those chords, G chord, C chord, D chord, A minor, B minor, and E minor, and the F sharp minor seven flat five, which always gets left out, poor little thing. We've got these chords, they all fit together, and we know that the scale tones fit over all of those chords. Those chords are all made up with the same notes that are found in the scale. So we've got this key, we've got the major scale, and those chords that go together. But some of the notes, sound better than others over some of the chords. I call it this Orwellian principle, where all notes are equal, but some are more equal than others. So here, let me just get a little loop going on here with a G chord, just a static G chord. Uh... Now, if I play the G major scale over that whole thing, Good, right? All of those notes are fine over it. This note, really, really nice note to start and finish on. If I finished on this note, it sounds okay. It sounds like it's going somewhere. It's either going down there, or that's where it's resolving. If I hit this note, that's just not a happy camper over that chord to finish on. Oh, it is there. If it resolves down, it's great. You can walk through it. That's fine. It's fine in that context. It's just not nice to stop on. Like it, it's just pulling, come on. Oh, it's pulling again. This note, D, it's great. Can stop there fine. <laughs> That's really pulling down that one. Now, if we go, keep going. Now this one is a little bit weird in this particular context. It can sound cool. This is the seventh, the F sharp. Uh, it's really pulling up there, isn't it? So what I want you to hear there is that all of the notes kind of work if you're playing in a scalar way. But where you finish a phrase, the note that you land on, really wants to be a particular note. And those particular notes are the chord tones. Now, you could then surmise that you're going to go, OK, well, I'm playing over a G chord in the key of G. The notes in the G chord are G, B, and D. So I'm going to find my G, Bs, and Ds and land on them when I'm on a G chord. And that kind of might work. But you've got to remember that the target notes, the chord tones, are changing every time the chords change. So if you're doing a chord progression that goes G, D, A minor to C, for example, the, chords are ch the target notes are changing every time the chords change. So you'd have to be going, right, I'm looking for a G, B, and a D. OK, a D. Now we're looking for a D, F sharp, and A. OK, now we're looking for an A, C, and an E. And now we're looking for a C, E, and a G. I mean, really? That's just far too much thinking for music making. Music making is about feeling, about 
being relaxed and chilled out. You don't want to be thinking about stuff like that while you're improvising. That is awful. And luckily, there's a better way, which is you listen and you react to the things that you hear. That's how it starts anyway. Eventually, you're likely to develop a relationship between your musical imagination and your fingers so you can kind of imagine where the good sounds are going to be and then you just go straight to them. Your fingers will know how to get to the to the good notes or the right notes for your musical imagination because sometimes the wrong notes are right. Okay, so you can pick a note that's not in a chord tone and you might deliberately want that dissonance or that kind of slight crunchiness to it. For example, on that chord, the, the C note. You might want that. That's, a, that's an example where you deliberately want that slight crunchiness that the C note gives you over the G chord. So I'm not saying it's always bad, but it's a choice. And what you want to do is to train your ears to hear that. Now, there's some really interesting statistical reasoning going on here as well. Now, I'm not a statistician. In fact, I can barely say it, but the odds are really good. There's seven notes in the scale and three of them are good. If you land on a good note, great, you, you've, you're on already. If you land on a bad note, your odds are seven out of nine that if you sidestep one scale step, like not a tone or a semitone, definitely a scale step, you're going to end up on a good note. So if you land on a C or an E or a G, you're great. If you land on an, a D, then you can step down to a C or up to an E. C and E are both good tones, okay? If you land on an F, you can step down to an E or up to a G, and you're good again. If you land on the G, of course, you're a chord tone, you're right. If you land on an A, you can step down one to a G. If you step up, you go to the B. Now, B is particularly crunchy, so you're probably likely to very quickly hear like, oh yeah, okay, I've got to step up again and you'll be at the root note. So that one requires two scale steps up or one scale step down. The same with the last note, B. If you hear that one, it becomes a bit obvious, to be honest, pretty quickly. You'll hear that you're on, on the seventh degree of the scale and you'll step up quickly to get up to that root note. So you can step up one there, or if you step down, you end up on the six and you'd have to step down again. So yeah, seven out of nine times, if you go one scale step in either direction, you can end up on a good note, which is pretty good odds. If you end up on one of those funny ones, you just step again and you're right again. Now, and this is all getting very mathsy, and it shouldn't be about that. It's much more about the ear stuff. I just wanted to explain to you that the maths make sense. It works. It really does work. And with a little training, your ears will help you, help guide you to the good notes anyway. So don't get too bogged down in this. We're going to start doing now some very practical examples, and I'd really like you to grab your guitar and do this along with me so you hear it. This is how I've been teaching it in workshops, and I absolutely know that it works. So I want you to try and do that. So uh, hit pause now, go and grab your guitar. Now, I've been teaching this stuff in workshops for years and years and years, and there are certain mistakes that nearly everybody makes. So I'm going to explain to you what those mistakes are, but then you're going to have to really pay attention not to make them, because you probably will anyway. Uh, when I'm in the room in a workshop, obviously, I can say, no, don't do that. You're making that same mistake again. The most important thing here is not to rush and is to play, let notes ring out for a long time and really listen. It's very tempting. What I'm going to do, basically, I'm going to give you a chord and I'm going to give you three notes and you have to choose which is the good note or which are the good notes. Sometimes there's going to be more than one. Okay, that's the object of this little game that we're going to play and it'll teach you what to do and then you can work on it on your own. If you've got a looper pedal, it's great. You can set it up yourself as well, but I'll give you hopefully enough time to be able to figure this out as well. So just as an example, I've got a G chord there and I'm going to give myself the three notes the first finger, the A, B, and the C. That's the first finger, third finger, and little finger on the third string. This is the G major scale, the notes on the third string. And we're going to be listening to it over a G chord. And it's really important, these restrictions. There's only three notes, there's one chord. So here's the chord that I was using earlier. So let's just listen to each of the notes. So there's the first one. And you want to hear, it's like, is that resolved? Is it a chord tone? Not sure, let's try the next one. That feels a lot more consonant to me. Now we try one more. Oh, yeah, that feels harsh. That one sounds pretty. 
pretty good. Of course, I know the answer to this. I'm just showing you what you should be doing, going, well, that one's not bad. Kind of sounds pretty. But that sounds more like it's the chord tone. Okay, that's the exercise there. It's about listening to each of the notes over the chord because sometimes the notes that are a little bit funky will still sound cool and you might want to choose them. But what I'm trying to get you to do is to react to what you hear and to find the chord tone using your ears, not using maths, not using knowing the names of the notes or any of that sort of stuff. Okay, so same exercise again, exactly the same exercise. So using these three notes, the A, B, and the C, second fret, fourth fret, and fifth fret. Only what I'm going to play for you now is going to be an E chord. I don't really need to set this on a loop, but I will anyway. So here's an E minor chord, same thing. I'm going to play it, and I want you to figure out which of those three notes is the chord tone, which is the most consonant, nice note to sit on. Here we go. Uh, three, uh. Just try it out. Try the first note with your first finger. Play it and listen to it. What does it sound like? Do you think it's a chord tone or not? Okay, let's try the next note. That's the fourth fret on the third string. Just listen to it. Just play it. Don't be in a hurry. Just play it. Still, you should still be playing that same note and listening. Okay, now try the next note with your little finger. Play it and listen. Now play them all again, really slowly. And see if you can figure out which one is the chord tone. Got it, yeah. Okay. If you need more time on this, grab yourself up, either listen back to this little part or make a loop yourself. Now, I'm going to show you what most people do when they start doing this exercise. Uh, if that'll just play now for me, please, Looper. Why are you not playing? Well, that was an unexpected pain in the bum. My looper pedal has decided to stop working. It's still flashing lights on, but the button is no longer playing or recording or doing anything else. It's just flashing away. I've pulled it apart, nothing obvious. Uh, so I'm going to have to resume this lesson another day. So in the next scene, I'm going to be wearing a different set of clothes. Uh, maybe won't have shaved or whatever, but don't freak out. That's why. It's two days later and I'm back with a new looper pedal. It seems to be working, so let's crack on. I believe I was about to explain what usually happens when people do this like at a workshop, when I ask them to do this exercise and I've said you want to really listen to the notes and listen to them one at a time, this is, this is usually what happens. So I'll be playing the chords and then they'll go. And then they'll look at me like, is that the right one? Trying to guess on my face. And it doesn't work. It, it, that's not going to give you what you want. You need to be listening and trying to figure out the chord tone by feeling whether it's sitting with the chord or not. So what I mean by that, this first note, if I play that a little bit, it feels a little bit crunchy. It's not sitting in it. And especially if I play the next note, it feels like it's kind of going there. Now it wants to kind of settle here. This note on its own feels settled. If I go away, it wants to come back again. This one, this definitely for me it just sounds like out of tune. Kind of. It's not out of tune, it's just not a very good note choice, but it's, it's really drawing. It's drawing to that note. So that is the exercise, is trying to find these, which is the right note that fits over that chord. Now, you can use any of the chords in the key of G with the G major scale in any group of strings. And it's definitely worth exploring. By far, the best way to do this is with a jam buddy. So if you've got one person who's going to play the chords, you select, pre-select three notes that you're going to try it, and you're going to try and figure out which is the right one. You kind of discuss it. Because there are lots of times where you can, it can feel a little bit confusing because a note can sound really cool, 
but not a chord tone. Now, a good example of that same loop. So we're still on E minor. It's dead easy for you to set these loops up on your own as well if you've got a looper pedal. Definitely recommend getting into a bit of that. Uh, so the same chord, E minor, but we're going to now look at the notes on the thinner string. Still G major scale, but we're just looking at 2nd fret, 3rd fret, and 5th fret of the thinner string. So let's do the same exercise here. First note. I mean, it sounds pretty cool. But especially when you play the next note, you can feel it's kind of that. It's drawing here, it's pulling toward this note. This one is right at home, should do. It's a chord tone. If I deviate, it's drawing back. Still always pulling back to here. This actually sounds pretty cool. But you can really hear it drawing toward the chord tone. And that is what you're after at this point. You're, so have, you've got a bunch of notes. You're looking for the note where things are pulling toward the home notes. Now, it's a very restrictive exercise, this, and that is the point. It's very easy to expand on the exercise when you feel confident with just doing the really small restricted groups. Let's do one more, actually, uh, before we go any further. So let's pick a, uh, let's pick a D chord, because this has got some interesting stuff in it as well. Just clear my looper. <laughs> to even worry about your loops being too perfect or anything because it's just hearing the sound. You could use keyboard pads as well for this if you want. So let's use the thinner strings again. It sounds like bang on. If you, uh, you, know, if you thought about there's your D chord, it's obviously a chord tone, right? Flashy. Really pulling down, resolving. also feels pretty cool. So in this example, there are two notes that work great over that. They're both chord tones on that particular string. So I would definitely recommend picking individual chords first of all. So use, stay in G major for the first part and then just try over a G chord, over an A minor, B minor, C major, D major, E minor chords and then just experiment with picking a particular string group. Obviously the second string being that it's only got two notes is kind of of less value in that exercise. You're better off picking uh, the other, yeah, fourth string, third string and thinner string are more likely. On the thicker strings can just get a little bit murkier and harder to hear at the beginning. Once you feel confident with that, it's totally cool to then expand it to finding the notes, all of the home notes over the whole scale, but really trying to register where those home notes are. Don't think about it. Don't, don't allow it to become a thought process where you're thinking, oh, I'm on this chord and this is that note, and that's how it works. Just try and use your ears to let your ears guide you to the right notes. Um, a great example of that, I'm gonna do a B minor chord now. We're still in the key of G. Um, uh. So I'm going to start on the thinner string. Oh, that was not happy. Uh, there we go, that's better. That's very bad. It's not bad. That's a great note. So I'm, I'm, once I find one that I'm fairly sure is a home note, I'm returning to it a little bit. That's weird. Yeah, that's all right. So we've got these two home notes. Ooh, ooh. Ooh. Uh, there we go. 
hear it pulling off. Really, really wants to go there. So this on that string, it's kind of fun. That's horrible. That's really good. So there are home notes, real strong ones. So once you're hip with this really restrictive thing of just picking one string or three notes and then trying to find the right one, then you can expand to playing one chord for ages and then exploring which of the notes across the whole scale pattern are the ones that feel home. But remember, don't make it, don't think about it too much. You let your ears kind of feel your way through a little bit. A more advanced version of this same exercise would be to have one where the chords are changing but very slowly because the, in the real world, that is actually what's happening. Your, the home notes are changing every time there's a chord change. So it can definitely be a nice example to just do something again real slow. Three, here, G, oh, the G becomes a terrible note of the second chord, so if you've landed on a funky one, just move. So as you get better at playing over chord progressions and kind of being able to target the moving home notes, your playing generally will start to sound more melodic because the lines that you play will be fitting with the chord progression, which is generally what happens if somebody's singing a tune. They're most of the time singing notes from the chords as the chords change. Not, of course, all the time. And there are, again, just like in guitar solos, sometimes you want notes that are a little bit outside or a little bit dissonant but the ma majority of the time that's what's going on so when you start doing that in your improvising it sounds more melodic more like you're playing in the band instead of on top of the band now there's a few things going on here one you're having to learn to listen to what's going on around you and this is a real kind of guitarist curse that i see often people just like they get in their own little zone and they're totally focused on what they're doing and not paying attention to the to the whole what the audience is hearing because the audience is hearing the lead guitar combined with the rhythm guitar or the band or whatever is going on around it not just that one thing so I think part of this journey is the, the learning to listen to what you're doing and the effect that it has with everything else that's going on, which is also important for things like rhythm, not overplaying, uh, making sure you don't play over the singer. And there's, there's all these things that you'll learn as part of this journey. That working on reactive listening will influence your playing in lots of different positive ways, mostly because you're learning to listen better. Time to talk about your practice schedule for Major Scale Maestro Unit 2. I've got three five-minute exercises for you. Now, if you've got time, you can do all three every time you practice, or you might just do one of the exercises and alternate between them. It's important at this stage that you work on the stuff that you know you need to work on. So if you're kind of comfortable with the scale pattern, perhaps you've learned it before, you're already familiar with it, maybe you don't do that as much as you do reactive listening, because that one will become more important. But let me go through the exercises first of all. The first one is major scale practice, playing the scale up and down. But this time I'd like you to add in random direction changes. So you'll still be doing it with the metronome. Hopefully you started working on the, with the metronome last time. I haven't got my metronome to hand actually, so I'm just going to do it without the metronome. But imagine there's a metronome on. The idea would be that you're going to play the scale without stopping but changing direction at random. So this might be a little difficult at the full speed that you got to in the previous week. So slow, knock your metronome down a little bit. Just start. 
and you can change halfway. Doesn't matter when you're changing direction, what matters is that you keep it consistent. You can do just like little bits like that. Doesn't matter, or you can try, you know, longer passages where you're going in the same and then change direction again. The thing here, the, th the, the focus should be on the continuity here. I want you to be able to do it without stopping. So no going. It's got to be do ba ba da da ba. Just really trying to keep with the metronome without having a break. This kind of exercise forces your brain to get even more familiar with the pattern, okay? There's something pretty magical about it that when you start doing this exercise, it will feel difficult the first few times because you will have built in this muscle memory of playing the whole scale up and down. And that isn't what happens in the real world. You don't tend to play full scale. So starting to add in the random direction changes makes it a little bit more difficult. If you find that too easy, if you're like, yeah, man, I've been doing this a while, I'm cool with that. You could also try doing random notes from the scale Okay, completely random, as big a jumps as you can manage, but still trying to do it continuously. So you pop your metronome on. Most people find the random notes exercise pretty difficult and if you've chosen that one you're probably going to have to slow the metronome down a bit that's totally fine it is really important that you stay continuous and right with the metronome without any delay so slow the metronome down to a point where you can do that okay and of course any wrong notes means you have to slow down again or go back to playing the scale with random direction changes the second exercise is going to be your reactive listening. Now, the best way to do this is definitely with a jam buddy. So one person plays the chords, the other person tries to find the right note on any particular string. The fact that you can discuss it with somebody else is really valuable here because doing it on your own, it can get a little bit, I'm not sure, is, is, is it this note? Is this the good note or is that the, the, the good note? So, you know, when you're working with somebody else, you can kind of discuss it and it's more likely that you're going to come up with the right answer. If that doesn't work, then you can use a looper pedal. So looper pedal is a fantastic tool for learning guitar, something I wish I had had uh, when I was learning. But, you know, if you haven't got one, I definitely recommend checking one out. They're not expensive now, especially this when I use the TC Electronic Ditto, you know, really inexpensive <laughs> reliability question. I'm, a, I'm only joking there. That I, my looper pedal that died, I'd had for, I don't know how long, probably might even be like 10 years or something. I've had it a long time. It's been well traveled and well, well worn, and the new ones working fine again. But uh, yeah, getting yourself a looper pedal is a really, really good plan. Just pick one chord, play it over. You can do it for chord progressions as well. And of course, the, having a looper pedal and being in control of it yourself, you can work on the ones that you feel like you need the most help with. Uh, the third option is to use a backing track. Now, uh, I'm going to make one and pop it over on the website. So check out the website if you need yourself a short little MP3 with just some of the random chords that you might want to play along with uh, and use as exercises for yourself as well. The third exercise on your schedule is going to be the one finger solos. Now, you should definitely be paying attention to your reactive listening while you're doing that. It's not just about jumping around with your first finger. Jumping around with the first finger will help with the pattern development but it's really you want to be improvising for real and that involves reactive listening okay so really try and develop that every time you're ever playing guitar from now on you should be trying to listen to what you're doing and reacting to how what you're playing is going on with the environment that you're playing in the the other people that you're working with the backing track or whatever it is you should be trying to react and make it it's, it's a bigger deal than just this one exercise it's it's a really powerful thing that will affect pretty much everything that you play. So definitely give it uh, good attention. And while you're doing your one finger solos, the other things that are really important is the stuff that we talked about initially, having a breath when you're playing, don't feel like you have to play continuously here with the one finger thing, okay? That's a specific exercise for scale development. With the one, with the one finger solos, you're trying to be melodic. So you're trying to play just a little bit, have a little rest, play another little line, have a little rest. Remember some repetition, have a little rest. Have a little bit of more repetition. Have a little rest. Okay? Think about your phrasing. Think about trying to develop a motive or develop an idea. Trying to get in touch with your musical imagination and let that guide your fingers. So you might try and 
you know, the first few times that that happens where, where you get a musical idea and you're able to actually play it, it's an incredible thing. But you have to be open for that to happen. And, and this kind of one finger solos and being aware that there's this other musical idea that you might find in your imagination and you're going to let that come out. I think that's a, a really, really powerful thing to be working on as well. If you've got any problems or you're struggling with any of these exercises, do head over to the website and let us know in the comments. You might find that somebody's already asked a similar question and we've answered it in the text for the lesson. So you might want to check there too. And it'd be great to see some of you guys improvising with this. I'd love to see some of your one finger solos over the backing tracks or some of you doing the reactive listening. Just drop a link to a video in the comments on the website and we'll do our best to try and check out some of that. I really hope you've been enjoying the course so far. There's some funky stuff coming up in the next session where we're going to check out pattern two of the major scale and talk about how to link two patterns together when you're improvising. That is loads of fun. I hope you'll join me for that. If you're over on YouTube, always appreciate you hitting the subscribe and don't forget to slap me a like. I'll see you for plenty more very soon. You'll take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.